Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Welcome back, wildlings. Are you not a gleaming diamond in the job market? Have you found a job that gives you bennies on par with those that are? Do you figure that's a bit sus? Well, maybe you shouldn't ignore that feeling. Our protagonist finds that out in tonight's shocking story of cinematic savagery, part one of I'm a Cinema Usher. We have some strange rules. By Drunken Swordsman. I've been working as a cinema usher for three years, and by now it's become obvious to me that my cinema's rules are, well, a bit out of the norm. Okay, that was a lie. They're batshit insane. You can be the judge of that yourself. My name's Sean, I'm 21 years old, and I've been working this job for three years now. There's two reasons why I ended up here, and why I didn't leave even after I realized just how effed up this place is. The first is that not many employers will hire a high school dropout with a criminal record for petty theft and drug possession. I made some bad decisions early on in life, and even though I'm on the straight and narrow now, my life has been marked forever by these unfortunate choices. The second reason is the pay. A cinema usher's job is checking tickets, cleaning rooms between shows, and checking that every movie runs smoothly. Usually ushers earn minimum wage if they're lucky. I, on the other hand, get the same pay as the manager of any normal joint. Although, when you take into account the stuff that I have to deal with every day, it does become a whole lot less alluring. But none of you really care about that, do you? Uh, you're here for the story, and I won't disappoint. So, here they are. The rules of my cinema. Rule 1. Never, ever open the door to room 3 once the movie has started. Sounds simple, right? This rule, and the time I almost broke it, were the first signs I got that this cinema wasn't 100% normal. Now even knowing about room 3, you will be tempted to go in. The room's clever, and it'll try to trick you in any way it can. You might hear something from inside, you might be addressed by someone wanting you to open it, but you should never, ever do so. The first time I almost entered room 3 was a mere week after I got hired. I had read the rules, sure, and I'd been confused by them, but I didn't question them. I needed this job. Badly. If I had to endure some extravagant, mysterious rituals and rules to get my paycheck, then so be it. I was cleaning up the main lobby, where the entrance to the individual projection rooms is, when I heard it the thumping of something on a hard surface. And it was coming from room three. I rushed over to the door. It was clear something was wrong inside. A thin curl of smoke was coming from under the door. The thumping was louder now, as if someone was hitting the door inside with their fists. The handle was turning, rattling in its joint as the person on the other side tried desperately to get out. Hello? I yelled, pressing my ear to the flat surface of the door. Let us out! Help us! came a voice from the other side. It was a woman's voice, terror audible in every word. Underneath it I could hear a faint whooshing sound like a strong wind in a tunnel. It took me a second to realize what that was. It was the sound of flames. There's a fire! The door's jammed! You have to let us out! The woman screamed desperately. The smoke coming from under the door was dark and acrid, and I coughed as it caught in my throat. The beating of the fists on the other side of the door resumed. Let us out! Please! Let us out! I reached for the door handle. Any thoughts of the rules in my head were gone. There were people in there who needed my help. And a hand reached out from behind me and grabbed my arm. I jumped in shock, twisting around. It was David, my manager. I'd only ever talked to him at my interview for the position where he struck me as a calm but distant man. 
Now he was furious, anger engraved in every line of his face. Rule one. Never forget it. There's a fire inside, David. The, 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 the door's jammed. We need to get them oh. out. A fire. Oh, it's clever today. David laughed to himself. Trying it on the new guy, too. Then he turned serious again. There's a reason we have rules. Leave room three alone. Everything is all right in there. I could hardly believe what I was hearing. The woman from inside cried out again. She was choking on her words now as the smoke invaded her lungs. Please help me, Sean. I can't breathe. Let us out. David <laughs> laughed again. <laughs> you can hear her, David. They're gonna die, I yelled, incredulous as to how he could be so heartless. Well, I wasn't going to let people die because of him and this batshit crazy rule. I reached out for the door handle, and David looked me dead in the eyes. How does it know your name? I stopped short. Had I told her my name? No. I looked at the door again. No smoke. No hammering of fists. I cautiously knocked on it a few times. No one answered. David put one hand on my shoulder. You see, Sean, he said patiently, room three stays closed, no matter what. In 20 minutes, the movie will end, and everyone will come out unharmed. I promise. But... But... But I heard her. I saw the smoke, I stammered, confusion taking over. You saw what it wanted you to see. Take it from me, Sean. Room 3 will try everything to get you to open that door, but it hasn't succeeded in 13 years, and it damn well won't succeed while I'm the manager here. I won't have that happen again. He led me away from the door gently. When the movie in Room 3 ended, 20 minutes later, a crowd of people walked out. Everyone was unharmed. I checked the room afterwards. There were no signs of any fire anywhere. Rule number two. If you see a man dressed as a movie character leading children away from the lobby, notify the manager immediately. You know how a lot of cinemas hire people in costumes or suits to promote new movies? Like when a new Star Wars movie comes out and you have guys in stormtrooper armor walking around the building to hype people up. I hated that sort of stuff even before I started working here. One of the odd jobs that I took up after dropping out of school was at a seedy, rundown amusement park outside of town. I had to wear a rancid, unwashed fursuit of the park's mascot for eight hours straight, six days a week. Even seeing one of those things nowadays makes me gag. Now, rule two is a bit of a mystery. I've only ever had to follow it once, and I'm not even sure what really happened. But it's an interesting, albeit gruesome story, so you might enjoy it. The day it happened was our premiere of Avengers Infinity War. The manager had hired several cosplayers dressed as the main characters to walk around the lobby and take pictures with fans. Now, I was generally okay with that despite my past experiences. The thing that made me nervous was how, before the shift began, Dave rounded up all the ushers and made us memorize the list of superheroes that he had hired. He was absolutely adamant about it, insisting that we knew all of them by heart. If it hadn't been for the incident with Room 3, I would have thought he was mad. But by now, I knew that not everything was as it seemed in this place. It wasn't a long list, so I can still remember it. Captain America, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Thor. Retrospectively, the poor guy dressed as the God of Thunder must have been devastated at how fat his favorite character got in Endgame. I knew something was up when I exited one of the projection rooms and saw a person dressed as the one and only Iron Man walking slowly down the lobby towards the garbage room getting closer, I could see that there was something seriously wrong with him. 
His suit had been high quality once, but it seemed to be in disrepair now. It was grimy and scraped, uh, some parts in danger of falling off altogether. He smelled horrible, like roadkill on a hot summer day. But the worst part of it was there was some sort of dark liquid seeping from between the joints of his costume. It was a sickening dark brown color, viscous, almost like drying treacle. My heart stopped as I saw that behind him was a group of children. None of them could have been more than 13 years old. They stared vacantly forward, following the fetid figure as he led them away from the crowds in a demented column. My ordeal with Room 3 had taught me all I needed to know about the rules. I rushed over to the manager's office, tore inside, and yelled into David's room, Rule 2! Iron Man costume, heading towards the garbage rooms, three kids in tow! There was a bang from the office as David leapt from his chair so fast it crashed to the ground. Shit, shit, shit. I should have known. I shouldn't have hired anyone. I shouldn't have fucking hired anyone. God damn it! I should have known! He was rummaging around in a drawer of his desk that he had quickly unlocked. I caught a glimpse of what he was taking out before he hid it in a pocket of his trousers. A vial of some sort of clear liquid and a long, jagged knife made of what looked like bronze. As he tore out of the office, he stopped and grabbed me, pushing a crumpled piece of paper into my hand. Make sure no one goes into the garbage room. Don't let anyone inside, you got that? If I don't come out, in half an hour, hit the fire alarm and evacuate the building. Then call the number on that paper. There was no time for questions. David tore out of the room and I ran after him. As we rounded the corner, I saw that Iron Man had almost got the children into the garbage room. He was maybe three meters away from the door, the kids still following blindly. David tore past them and rammed open the door. Then in one clean movement, he grabbed the costume thing, threw it inside, and slammed the door shut. The children twitched like puppets with their strings jerked up and down. Then they looked around, confused. They probably didn't even know how they'd gotten there, so they did what any kid that age would do in that situation. They started to cry. It was 23 minutes before David left the garbage room. There were dark red marks on his once clean shirt and a horrible stench wafted off him. He looked tired. <sighs> to clean up in there, Sean. If you find anything strange outside of a garbage bag, don't touch it. Just come and tell me. Then he stumbled off to his office. The garbage room was a wreck. The stinking dark liquid stained the floor, the walls, even the ceiling in some places. In the corner there were several black plastic bags, and a wet patch of that noisome dark liquid was slowly spreading from underneath them. Rule number three. If a man with a tattoo on his left cheek wants something from the lost and found, don't give it to him. Now this one isn't exactly tied to a story that I personally experienced, but I still have something to say about it. After the Rule 2 incident, David started treating me more kindly. I, I guess he trusted me a bit more since he knew that I'd learned my lesson, and I understood that the rules weren't there for some spurious reason. They were there to protect us all. I was curious about Rule 3. After some time, I summoned the courage to ask about it, so before one day's shift, I walked into the office and cautiously asked. David? Um, I'm sorry to bother you, but, uh... I was wondering if you could tell me more about Rule 3, by chance? David smiled wryly. Hmm, curious, are you? Don't worry, I would be too. He began rummaging about in his drawers and file folders. Eventually, he handed me several yellowed papers stapled together in the corner. Here, read this when you're on break. Hopefully... That'll slake your curiosity. When my break came, I sat down in our locker rooms and did exactly that. The papers were actually several newspaper articles stapled together. The first one 
was 15 years old. Gruesome triple homicide. Family murdered in their own house. Sole survivor tells horrifying story. The neighborhood of was left in shock yesterday after police found a gruesome murder scene in the house of local residents, the Prescotts. Of the family of four, there was only one survivor, 13-year-old Prescott, who was found bound and gagged, but otherwise unharmed, in his family's living room, next to the mutilated remains of his parents and older sister. Found on the crime scene was an umbrella which the survivor claims his mother had forgotten after the family's visit to a local cinema earlier that week. Cinema manager David told our reporters that the umbrella had been picked up by a tattooed man the day before the murder, who claimed it was his. Police are looking into the possibility this man was connected to the crime, but so far their search has proved unsuccessful. The next two articles were 12 years old and 5 respectively, and published by different newspapers, but they told much the same story, a mass homicide. One mentioned an item from our lost and founds being found at the scene of the crime. The other didn't, but David had written underneath it in pencil, the same man. What does the tattoo mean? Need to make a rule about him. The last article was what really creeped me out though. It wasn't modern, in fact it was just a printed photo of an ancient looking page. The year printed at the top announced it to come from London in 1899. The writing was hardly legible, but the headline told me all I needed to know. Fear the stage. London theater shuts down amid murder spree as mysterious killer claims forgotten items. Now, I've worked some weird gigs in my long and less than stellar job history, but never one quite that bad. If you want to hear more, we'll be coming back to this later in the other parts. Until then, stay scary, my wildlings. Remember, some other poor schmuck always has it worse, and make the most of your nights. Maybe see a movie. <laughs>